church say amen. Amen. Tonight we ask that you turn to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. Ministry Next Generation presents Sheila Combs in the case of the Great Jewel Robberies Mystery Dinner on Saturday, February 16th at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Beverly Hills Diamond Convention Center. Oh, <laughs> also known as the Fellowship Hall. <laughs> the tickets are $15 per person, so you can purchase your ticket from, tickets from either Donna Thornton, Ellie Howell, or Pauline Gearman. And the menu, of course, is chicken cordon bleu with hollandaise sauce, rice pilaf, spinach souffle, salad, rolls, and butter. So again, the tickets are $15 per person. So you can see Miss Ellie or Miss Pauline or Miss Donna. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 18, 1 reads. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he, had, that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I, do, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look at this, look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At this time, please, by yes or prayer. Father God, we come to you saying thank you. We thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for bringing us together one more time. And now, God, as we get into your word, we ask you, God, to help us. Lord, help us not to leave the same way we came. But through your word tonight, God, we leave better people. Through your word tonight, God, we leave with forgiveness in our heart. Through your word tonight, God, we leave with peace in our, in our minds. Through your word tonight, God, we leave with joy. Lord, as we decrease, that you increase, God. Lord, we ask you, God, to open our eyes that we may see what you have us to see. Open our ears that we may hear what you have us to hear. And God, open our hearts that we may receive what you would have us to receive. Lord, don't, help, don't let us leave hard-hearted, but help us, God, leave with you in our hearts and our minds. And we come give you the praise, the honor and the glory. In Jesus' sweet and precious name we pray. And church say amen. amen. The book of Jeremiah, we look at Jeremiah there. Jeremiah, there was four major prophets in the Bible. Jeremiah was one of his prophets. It's Ezekiel, it's Jeremiah, it's Daniel, and then it's Isaiah. Jeremiah was there as they were, was what they call a weeping prophet. He always... <laughs> Or think, oh, we have bad news to give. So we look at Jeremiah tonight, and then we're talking about verse 18, chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. When you look at Jeremiah 18, really he's here in this section of passage of scriptures, he's talking to the nation of Israel. But then we know that in every in everything in the in the word of God, we can get application out of it for ourselves in today's time. And then when you look at like what he's talking about there, we have, I'm, I'm sure most of y'all have heard this about the potter and the clay. I think that is even a song about the potter and the clay. But we look at this passage of scripture, and then the, 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 the subject that, I, that, that God has given me was God is shaping us. Because when you look at the potter and the clay, that's what the potter does. He shapes whatever he's making. He shapes the, 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 the pot or the ashtray or whatever it is, whatever he's putting on that wheel at that time, he's shaping it. And then I looked up the word pottery. It says pottery is made by forming a ceramic, often clay, body into objects of a required shape and heating them to high temperatures in a kiln, kiln which removes all the water from the clay, which induces reactions that lead to permanent changes, including increasing their strength and hardening and setting their shape. 
And you might say, well, what that has to do with this lesson? When you look at what a potter does to that pot or to that, that, that whatever object that he's making, he or she makes, you look at what it does. It, 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 he, he, he shapes it, he forms it, and then he puts it in the fire. Well, what that has to do with us? God shapes us, he forms us, and puts us in the fire. So when we come out, we come out not glitched as if you look at verse 4, it says marred. The word marred, it talks about imperfect. It talks about having glitch on you. And even you see one part about, about, about what, we talk, what I read about the pottery, when you talk about the water being inside, there's something inside of that pot. And so that's why the potter, the, the potter puts it in the, in the fire. So you get whatever is in there out of there. And so that's what God does with us. When he puts us through the fire, it's not for us to retreat. It's not for us to turn around. But it's for us to know that he's trying to get that stuff out of us that we didn't think was in there. All of us, as I always say, we have all born in sin. We've, and there's not a perfect person in this place from here to the back door. There's not a perfect church. But what God does, he puts us through the fire, not to hurt us, not to mistreat us, but he puts us through the fire to let us know that, hey, I want to make you perfect. I want to get all them impurities out of you so you can go and do my work. Now, if you choose not to do God's work, that's not on God, that's not on the devil, that's not on anybody but yourself. And so when you look at what Jeremiah was talking about to the nation of Israel, when the potter puts that, put that clay, first it starts out as clay. And so when we start out, we start out, we start out in sin. And so God had to put us on that wheel to get us to the point where he wanted us to be. And when he put us on that wheel, which is the Holy Spirit, it takes out all those things that we had in us before we came to Christ. Amen? Because, see, God can use us if there's sin in our lives. And we talk about, people talk about the Ten Commandments. Well, well, I don't lie. I don't steal. But, baby, it's your attitude. It's just as bad as lying. Your rolling of the eyes is just as bad as stealing. And God can't use you. And, see, this is where the devil gets a lot of us. Because we think we've been used by God. Because we give in the offering. We pay our tithes. We sing in the choir. We preach and we do all these things. But babies, I'm here to tell you, if there's sin in your life, God is not using you. That's the devil using you. If you, for the life of me, I don't understand how people can come to church and say they've been made over by God, but still living like they live out in the world. That's not God. I said this morning in the journey, I'm tired of preachers sugarcoating everything, watering everything down because they're afraid to lose members. Where every member that a preacher lose, God can bring back to. Somebody is willing to do what God wants them to do. Because see, when God is shaping us, he's letting us know it's not about you. It's about me. It's about me getting my work done through you. See, there's a lot of people say they say being fooled by the devil. But we don't want to say we're being used by the devil. We try to say, no, that's just God. No, babies, God is not the author of confusion. The Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. If there's confusion, there's no God. Amen? Amen. If you think God is in the middle of confusion, then you're lying and you're wrong. Because God is not in the middle of confusion. And how can you come in and then you want to you you sit up here, put on your judgment robe, and complain about everything that goes on? You are just as wrong as the person that's messing up. Because then what God does, what he did in Jeremiah 18, he let Jeremiah know, go back and tell my people that if, 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 if the pot can be in the potter's hand, why can't y'all be in my hand? It's what God, why can't we be in God's hand? Why can't we trust God for the things that we need? Why can't we trust God to work out the problems that we have? Why can't we trust God to say, God, you are bigger than what I'm, what I'm going through. He's already knowing what you're going through. Why? Because he's the one that allowed you to go through the fire. And when you go through the fire, you're going through because God wants you to come out to say, Lord, if it had not been for you, I would still be where I am. 
But because he loves us, he puts us through the fire not to hurt us. He puts us through the fire to let us know there's something inside of us because we sometimes all thank you, Jesus. We sometimes say we got everything made because you're a pastor or you're a deacon or you're on this board or you're that board. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of people going to hell on those boards. There's a lot of people thinking they're doing things for Christ. There's a lot of people thinking, well, I haven't, I haven't lied. I haven't stolen. I haven't cheated. But again, your attitude is just as bad as my line. And you got to give an account for that. But when God begins to shape us, and this morning my message was, I once was blind, but now I'll see. When you begin to see what God is doing and how he's operating, you want to walk in his will. Because when you walk in his will, he will not lead you wrong. But when you start walking in your will, you're going to mess it up every time. Because now you want to do what you want to do. Let me come down. Now you want to do what you want to do. But when you begin to do what God wants you to do, you start seeing things from a different standpoint. You're now looking at it from a spiritual standpoint, not from a natural standpoint. Because if we start looking at everything from a natural standpoint, we want to stay in an abusive relationship. We want to stay doing what we're doing. Why? Because we're comfortable doing those things. Why? Because we were born into sin. And so when we sin, that's why it's so easy for us to do that kind of stuff. Because why? That's where we came from. But once you come in contact, my message this morning was talking about Saul on Damascus Road. I said, once you come in contact with Jesus Christ, your life should never be the same. When God has formed you and shaped you, your life should never be the same as it was before you came to Christ. You cannot bring in the old world into the new world. It just doesn't mix. That's like putting oil and water. Just that mix. You cannot say, I'm for Christ, but still trying to live the same way you were living before you came to Christ. When God has begun to shape you, that's time to change from who you were to where you are now. You cannot continue to live the same way over and over again then you expect God to bless. We have to wake up because there are people out there that need to know who Christ is. And we're the ones to show them. But if we're in here fighting amongst each other, rolling our eyes at each other, talking about each other, how in the world are we going to go out there and tell somebody who God is and we can't even get along up in here? But yet we still think we're doing the work of God when we sit up here, we up on the on the finance committee, or we up in the choir stand, or we up in the pulpit, or we're in the sign booth. Well, that's all well and good. But Jesus said, depart from me, I knew you not. Because there's going to be some prophesying in his name, there's going to be some teaching in his name, there's going to be some pre preaching in his name, and still on their way to hell. Because they think they got it all made up. But when God begins to shape you, shaping is... You humble yourself. See, God can't use you when you're prideful. He cannot use you when there's pride in you. Because why? Jesus was humble. And if we're supposed to be Christ-like, that means we have to take on the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved, we should love. Jesus forgave, we should forgive. Jesus was humble, we should be humble. Because when God begins to shape us, we don't want to do the things we were doing before. There should be a difference in what you were, where you were yesterday. There should be a difference in where you were last week. There should be a difference in where you were last year. Why? Because when you begin to grow in Christ, you don't want to stay stagnant to where you are. You want to continue to grow in him because the more you grow in him, the less likely you are to fall on him. Why? Because now your mind is on him. You totally have given him his credit. But what we mess up is we'll come in on Wednesdays, those that stay, and then we come in on Sundays. It's easy to fool me. It's easy to fool Pastor Kevin. It's easy to fool Pastor Sean. But you cannot fool God. It's easy to walk in here and let everybody give you all the accolades and say, oh, she's so nice. He's so nice. But what you do out there determines who you are and where you are in Christ. Because I, it's easy for me to come here and shout, preach, pray. But when I get out there, it's determined 
how well God has shaped me and how well did I form into what God has shaped me into. Because see, if I don't conform to what God shaped me into, then what I'm doing, I'm conforming to the world. Romans 12, 2 says, be ye transformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, if your mind had not been renewed, you're still stuck in the old mind and trying to be in a new body. It's not going to work. You need a new mind with a new body. You see, because we would think the old way, but still trying to live Christ's way. And you can't do that. So it's like we got one foot like a door. There's one foot in the door. You're trying to close, God's trying to close the door, but you won't let him close the door because your foot is in the way. Sometimes we get in the way. We expect God to move and say, God, I left the door open for you. No, you didn't. You got your foot in the way. But when you begin to move that foot and let God come on in, then God will begin to work. But when we try to handle Brother Ken, it's when we mess up. When we try to do it ourselves, when we try to handle the problem ourselves, when we try to do everything that we can other than trying Jesus. He's the one. He says that he's the author and the finisher of my faith. Therefore, he's the beginning and the end. And therefore, I must trust in him. Because why? He's shaping me into what he wants me to be. See, preachers still need to be shaped too. Because we don't have all the answers. We're not perfect. And so, what we have to do, we have to continue to pray, not just for our families, but we have to continue to pray for the congregations. We have to continue to pray for the, for the ones that need help. And we got to pray that God's way would be done inside his church. This is God's house. This is not Sean's house. This is God's house. We need to learn how to reverence God's house for who he is. If we put a little spin on this for a second. If I go to your house, and if I'm not, if you don't allow no one to eat and drink in your living room, why would you come eat and drink in God's house? And we have to wipe our feet to come into your house. See, people have lost, people have lost, and I'm not talking about first Baptist, I'm talking about churches in general, have lost the reverence for God's house. This is supposed to be the sanctuary. This is supposed to be the holy of the most holy. This is where we come in because you're sick, you need help. See, if you go to the hospital, that's why they keep it cold, to kill the germs that are there. If you go to the hospital and it's 90 degrees in the hospital, you're not going to get well because why? You're going to end up catching a virus in there because the germs are not being killed. Well, if you come in the sanctuary and there's all kinds of junk going on, you cannot let the spirit dwell in you because you're too busy trying to listen to the junk that's going on. If you need to talk junk, take it outside. As soon as you walk through those doors, you are, um, no, 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 time out. As soon as you get on that parking lot, you are God's place. Your mind should be on God. Your mind should be on what God should do for you. You should come in looking to expect something from God. But what we come in for, looking to pray and prance on whoever makes a mistake. You're already wrong right there. If you're going to come to church, well, I'm going to come. Oh, I can't wait to get there because Michelle is going to leave worship service tomorrow, tonight, and I can't wait till she misses a note because I'm a tail ass sister. <laughs> now, keep in mind, you can't sing a lick. But yet, you want to tell the worship leader how to leave worship service. We need to understand that God is shaping us, and when he shapes us, he wants us to come in his house to feel free to worship him. But if we come in, there's, there's drinking, and there's eating, and there's all this stuff going on. You're in God's house. But what they got to do is shape us. And when God begins to shape you, you want to respect him. And you want to respect the things that he do for you. 
Let me go over to one of y'all houses and just sit up there and eat and drink on your nice little couch. Ooh, Lord. He got the devil. <laughs> but when I come into your house, I expect you to treat me with respect. I, I expect you to treat me with hospitality. When you come into God's house, God expected us to give him our all. And we cannot give him our all sipping on our cup. The only thing in here that needs a cup is the baby. And that's what the nursery is for. Unless the mom is in there with him. Unless you got a medical condition. Medical condition. Well, that still ain't got nothing to do with shit. The baby's just a dust. Because once you start growing into Christ, Christ is showing you when they were in that temple, They said that priest, he had a rope tied around him. If that rascal wasn't right, that rope came back empty. God help us if he put ropes around half of us in here. How many would come back? Because see, we live holy on Sunday. And at halftime, some of you don't live holy on Sunday because you can come to God's house and treat it any kind of way. But when he's shaping you, you're not worried about where you come from. You're not worried about what you did. You're worried about now your relationship with Christ Jesus. That's the most important relationship that you can have. If you do not have Christ Jesus, I implore you to get him. Because without Christ Jesus, you will be lost. Without Christ Jesus, you can't do anything without Christ Jesus. His relationship should be the most important relationship that you ever have. What, what about my husband? What about my wife? Let me tell you something. Your relationship with Christ Jesus determines your relationship with your husband and with your wife. I ain't talking about no girlfriend and no boyfriend. I'm talking about your husband. I'm talking about your wife. Because, see, if you do not have a relationship with Christ Jesus, how can you have a relationship with your husband and your wife? A true relationship. See, when he shapes us, he's shaping us to let us know all these things that we need to do. And it's up to us. Because, see, he's not going to force himself on any of us in here. It is up to us to receive what he has for us. It is up to us to understand where Christ wants us to go. It is up to us to understand, okay, I can't do it this way anymore because I tried it this way all these years and it got me nowhere. It gave, it gave me a life of miserable sin. It gave me heartaches. It gave me headaches. But now that I tried Christ Jesus' way, no, it may not be easy. But what makes it easy is when I can surrender to Him and to Him alone. Some of us need to surrender to Christ. Some of us need to put Him first and follow Him. And quit following your feelings. Put your feelings in your pocket and put Jesus in your heart. God is shaping me. See, through those two wives that I had, God is shaping me for the next wife to come. He has showed me how to be a great husband. When I say a right husband, a spiritual husband. God has shaped me to be a father to my kids. And now God is shaping me to be a leader for my congregation. See, he had to put me through the fire. And I'm not telling you something that I have tried. He has put me through the fire. Because, see, we, 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 we want people to say, oh, he's so nice. And I was nice. Well, I'm still nice. But <laughs> people correct that. <laughs> <laughs> but my niceness wasn't going to get me to heaven what's going to get me there now is the Holy Spirit as nice as I was as no drinking, no smoking, none of that but what's going to get me to heaven is this thing inside of me which is the Holy Spirit so Talk about me as much as you want to. God bless you. People that talked about me before, you won't be the last person to talk about me. 
Because see, they talked about Jesus. They lied on Jesus. They crucified Jesus. And why did they do that? All for us. Because he loved us so much that he was willing to do that for all of us. So when he begins to shape you, he's shaping you to let you know you've tried it. Satan's way for so long. Try me. And when you begin to try, things begin to work in your favor. God begins to close doors that should have been closed a long time ago. And I'm going to tell you this too. When God begins to shape you, you're going to start losing friends. You're going to start losing family members because they don't understand what is taking place. What is taking place is a transformation. God is transforming you from your old self, as Paul says, to the new man. And when God begins to transform you, as I told him in the journey, it's like God, it's like we go in our jobs. Most jobs, you want a promotion. So you get that promotion. You've been fighting all those years to get that promotion. More money, you get up there and you say, oh, I'm making too much money. Let me go back to where I was. What fool would do that? So why would you, when God start elevating you to a point, follow me? in him where he has blessed you to minister. He has healed you so many times. Healed your family members. Put food on your table. Put shoes on your feet. Put clothes on your back. Put money in your bank account. Put a car in your driveway for you to go back to a life to where there was destruction. To go back to a wide life where there's depression. To go back to a life but it was let me kill myself. To go back to a life to where I, I just I just can't I can't take it anymore. Why would you do that? When God shapes you, He's shaping you not to go up and to go back. He's shaping you to go forward. He's shaping you to let you know I got the healing. I got the money. I got the cars. I got the homes. I got the woman. I got the man. I got whatever you need. It's in me. But when you start putting everything above God, he starts taking things away from you. Like I said, I said again until I die until I quit preaching here. I just don't understand how we say we love God. Come and eat these people food on Wednesday night and leave after, after the food is done. If you love God, the service says 6.30. If you love God the way you say you love God, all y'all that say y'all saved, I didn't say you were saved, you say you were saved, so therefore we need to live a life like we say. We can get up to go to work. We can get up to go to football games. We can get up to go fishing. We can get up, some of you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go deer hunting. But God forbid if Sean calls for a special meeting. Oh, why wow, we got to go out there. Amen? Amen? It's time to quit cutting out God. It's time to quit working out God's word. If you say you say, live a life like it. And I'm going to confess something. And I'm about to close. I had thought about leaving First Baptist Church of Dallas Park. When you allow, listen to this, allow the devil to come in, he will try to send you a bill of goods, Michelle. He will try his best to send you a bill of goods. And it looks good, too. 
a couple winces ago. I didn't come. A couple of people know why, but I'm not gonna tell everybody why. But it took somebody on my job to show me that's not what it's about. Matter of fact, it took two people. One, kind of semi-saved. One, never professed to be saved. Because I try to rationalize it, Michelle says, well, you know what? I have my own church. Bump them. But why are you telling us this? When God began to shape you, God began to show you. But when the people told me that, <laughs> that was God using them to let me know he's bigger than First Baptist Church of Dallas Park. He's bigger than Journey. He's bigger than the Baptists. He's bigger than the Pentecostal. He's bigger, bigger than the Catholics. He let me know that no matter what you go through, I have your back. You keep living the way you're living. I will take care of it. Whatever the situation is, I'm here to tell y'all, whatever your situation is, God will take care of it. Just keep living a life for him. You got to stop letting the devil play with your mind. You're too young and too pretty to let the devil come in your mind telling you you ain't worth it. God has more in store for you than you can ever imagine. But you got to put your mind on him. Quit worrying about those boys. Quit worrying about everything else. And worry about Christ Jesus and your relationship with him. That drama, you got to stop it, sister. God wants to use you. But you got to let him use you. You have a good head on your shoulder. That panic attack that is nothing but a pit for hell. Because all the devil wants you to do is turn back when God is trying to move you forward. He is shaping you into something great, sister. So you got to stop. You have a youth pastor, you can call. You have his wife that you can call. You have his daughter you can call. You have me you can call. You got Cornelia you can call. Don't let the devil use you. Don't let him drive. Get him out of the pasture of the Stop that car and say, you got to get out of here. Amen? You are too young for that. You shouldn't even have no problems. Me, that front row, Seth and Jenna, that row, and that row. <laughs> <laughs> you got a life to live the devil don't want you to live it God is shaping you you got to let him you right now is on, you're, you're on that wheel we talk about a potter's wheel you're on that wheel and God is ready to put you through the fire but right now he can't trust you because if he put you through the fire good lord you'll give up But you got to continue to let God work with you and work in you and work for you. And when you do that, you watch and see how God moves in your life. No boy is worth the trouble that you're going through. Nobody is worth the trouble that you're going through. You got to have a relationship with Christ Jesus. I hope you take what I'm saying to heart. See, I didn't know you were going to be here, but I'm proud of your mom. And people, yes, Kevin is a youth pastor. But some of us have been saved a whole lot longer than Kevin. We got words of wisdom to teach these young people. He can't do it by himself. He needs all of us praying for him. I said on his ordination service that if nobody else in this church prays, the parents 
of these young people should be praying for that man. It's time to stop tearing people down and build people up. God is not playing. You ever see him? I saw black churches was bad, but y'all white people just as bad as black people. I've never in my entire life. There's always one person in a church that got to criticize everything in the church. Ain't nothing right. Well, honey, you ain't right. How many people go to church? About 300, 150, 200? If they all came? So out of 250 people, you mean tell me only one is right? Not even the pastor himself, because then we won't tell him how to preach. <laughs> but when God is shaping you, he's teaching you, it's about him. It's about what he has for you. It's about what he can and will do for you. But we must let him. We must let him. And one more thing. When God begins to shape you, there are going to be people trying to hold your past against you. I always tell people, you can hold my past all you want to. While you hold my past, God already done moved me, shaped me, that made me into what he is, and made me today, and moving me on to my future. So, while you're looking backwards, I've already moved forward. Paul says, a new mind. A new mind. If you come to church looking for problems, you're going to find a problem. But if you come to church expecting something from God, you're going to leave with something from God. The foolishness has to stop. There are people dying and going to hell. And we didn't hear word about next gen and, and, and whatever going on over there, the choir rehearsal and all this stuff. And oh, I'm not paying the $15 for that. that, that see, that's, that's the wrong attitude right there. It's not for Ellie, it's not for Donna, it's not for Pauline. But it's up here, God's kingdom. Come expecting from God. Stop looking at problems and look at Jesus. Because if anybody can fix it, it's Jesus. He's the one that can fix it. But if you can. Oh yeah. And this one black woman. Bless these black people. Father, in the name of Jesus. Heard him. Baby, you if you pray, you pray the wrong prayer. <laughs> what happened to Father? Forgive them. <laughs> Even Jesus said, "Forgive them." But seriously, if you say you're saved. You need to live like you're saved. Because once you get out those doors, in here, I can be the nicest person. I can smile in your face. But out there determines where you are in Christ. And being a mama, y'all can make y'all way up. When you leave tonight, those that were holding on to whatever you were holding on to, there's an altar. There's an altar. 
As a matter of fact, there's your seat. Don't leave with those same issues. You let God know, God, I know you're trying to shape me. I know you're trying to form me. I know you're trying to mold me. Please do it. Because I need you. God doesn't need any of us in here. We need him. Everybody stand.